Today's Lunch and Learn lecture highlights the history of Cypress Creek. It was mentioned by name as early as 1657 in land grants and its waters have witnessed much history in Isle of Wight County since that time. Cypress Creek, the residential community in Smithfield, was named for the waterway. Well, first of all, we have, who knows what this tree is? Cypress. Absolutely. Okay, that's the end of the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> So, the cypress trees along the waterways gave the creek, as in Cypress Creek, its name as well as providing a valuable resource for trade. These trees are known as bald cypress. They're deciduous with needle-like leaves and they have distinctive knees. We have a guest knee here today, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about here in just a second. The Museums Behind These Walls video series, viewable on the museum's website and YouTube channel, documents various structures and sites in the county. Let's watch the piece on Scott's Factory to set the stage for today's talk. It sits on Cypress Creek and was an important location for the county's development. Today, we'll visit a certified tree farm along Cypress Creek where Scott's Factory once operated. When the factory opened in 1828 in a former grist mill and boat yard, it represented the first known attempt at manufacturing in Isle of Wight County. Fifty-five years ago, I got into the lumber business by going to work for my father-in-law, Stokes Kirk. And the Kirk family had a, a number of timber tracks to, they had bought through the years. Visible from Scott's Factory Road are the remains of an abandoned tenant farmhouse. To find what remains of the original factory, we had to venture past the farmhouse and through the brush with the current landowner. We have found uh, remnants of the old building, not much of it left, but it was a brick construction. And about two years ago, I was working with my metal detector back in the back area of the building. There's a place back there that I think was probably carved out uh, years ago when business was going on on this site to turn boats around. And my guess is that they were boats similar to the ones that the oystermen, the larger oystermen used that were called by boats and they'd be anywhere from 60 to maybe 85 or 90 feet long. I'm guessing and I'm assuming that the boats had a way to come in and circle around and possibly I'm doubting that they could get in here on anything other than maybe half tied to high on one going in or coming out. And I don't think there was enough water here to, to navigate at low tide. The original mill had several owners including Andrew Mackey and Josiah Parker. Parker's grandson sold it to John Ross in 1824. Ross built a four-story brick structure. James Scott of Norfolk then bought the property when it was known as Logan's Mill and had bricks marked Logan, even though no one by that name ever owned it. When Scott prepared to open the factory, an 18-foot, seven-ton iron shaft to hold the giant wheel that spun the machinery gears was hauled from a ship and then pulled five miles by 16 teams of oxen to the factory. It appeared to me that this was a, a big, big gear that was, apparently had a boom mounted to it and apparently was turned by possibly a hand crank to lift material off of the dock and then onto the boat. It was obviously there to make the, make the machine swing to, from shore to boat. Scott's factory was one of the two major cotton factories operating in Isle of Wight County during the 19th century. The other being Mount Holly, which opened in 1834. This track is very, very unusual. I, I never have talked to anyone who actually knew everything that went on down here. The factory ceased operations in 1862, and during the Civil War, the machinery was placed into storage. It was sold to Thomas Cook, a former Confederate officer from Smithfield, who relocated it to Danville and then by rail to Jamestown, North Carolina, where it was installed in a former grist mill. For 23 years, the Logan Manufacturing Company used the machinery to card and spin cotton. 
County records show multiple landowners for the property. By 1911, B.F. Latimer reserved 10,000 bricks from the factory building to be removed at his own expense. In 1937, those bricks were sold to Isla White County and used to create the vault addition to the clerk's office. Bricks were also used to build the wall around the courthouse grounds. These bricks are still visible today. There are no remnants of the former mill and Cypress Creek's footprint has been dramatically altered. Only bricks and a small bit of the factory's foundation remain. I believe we're at the uh, spot where the factory was, whatever it was. 35, 40 years ago when I was in here to supervise thinning the crop of timber that was in here, there were walls that were pretty visible that were still standing, but now I don't know what has what has transpired since then, but possibly more erosion or cover up with vines and honeysuckle and various uh, wetland species of plants. Uh, it kind of looks different than it did then. So isn't it amazing to think about boats turning around in Cypress Creek? Just the thought of that is amazing. So here's just the run of Cypress Creek that you can see right through here, and it's a major byway and waterway. A river is usually bigger than a creek, although there are instances that the word creek is used for a larger body of water dependent on the place or the country where it's located. These are the differences in rivers and creeks. Rivers flow in channels and have branches or tributaries while creeks do not. Rivers, especially the very large ones, are important sources of power supply, while creeks do not have enough power to be tapped for this purpose. Well, I don't agree with that because it was obvious that Cypress Creek was used to make that, uh, the uh, cotton factory, and uh, we found a lot of bricks. When we talked about the brick wall, we actually, she was crawling around on hands and knees, and we have video of the brick wall that we found. And so there were bricks manufactured, there were giant boats there, there was Scott's factory, there's cotton mill. So I can guarantee you that there was enough power, plus the mill out at Isle of Wight Courthouse. Uh, there, you'll notice there's no wheel at that mill. Uh, the water came through the upper part of the mill and uh, came down, it was called a mill race. And it would come from the one side of the, uh, it's not a creek, it was the mill pond actually, and the power of the water would turn the gears. So that water actually is part of the Norfolk water supply. Rivers are good means of transporting large and heavy objects like logs downstream, while creeks are shallow and are too small to allow this. Again, that's probably, we have special creeks here. <laughs> our, I think our creeks are special creeks. We, we you know. A creek can be formed by water from the sea while a river usually flows out to the sea. I'll go with that part. Okay. Uh, and so, and guess who was here first? These fellas and ladies. So this is 1608. This is a mural that was done by the WPA. And this represents John Smith coming across the waters and trading with the local Warsquoyak natives and uh, they provided 30 bushels of corn to assist in not letting the settlers starve to death. This is the original plat of 1750 Smithfield. Smithfield was pretty much founded on the banks of Cypress Creek. These were the lots uh, that were 72 lots that were offered for sale and uh, and here we are. Look how fancy those dudes are dressed. And I love the way that uh, as he comes down to the, uh, where the folks are with the hogsheads of tobacco or whatever, he's providing a beverage with a lovely, uh, really, <laughs> that's a bit much. But you see tobacco over here, and tobacco really wasn't a good crop here. Uh, it just didn't, our soil was not suited that much for tobacco. So let's talk about the uses were varied for the cypress uh, and important for the beginning of our colony. An important characteristic is that they're, is they're <coughs> rot resistant. They were used to make fence posts, doors, flooring, and very importantly for me who does the cemetery tours, caskets. <laughs> Cabinetry and boats. They're not used as much today because they're slow growing. 
And along, this, uh, along the boundaries of that, this is where uh, Arthur Smith the first came in 1637. And we had Arthur Smith the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth. No imagination in the Smith family, evidently. So his son, grandson, Arthur Smith the fourth, and probably his brother, assisted in that map that I just showed you about uh, offering those lots for sale. And because we were right on the river and the English wanted something on the navigable body of water that they could have trade. And it's pretty safe. If you look at the river, if you go on a tour with us, our walking tour of Church Street, you can actually see the way the river just does like this. And that was great for people coming in. And it was not great for the pirates who could come in, but they could not turn around and get out very quickly. So that made us a little safe. So... Right here we have our guest Cypress Knee. Uh, I'm not going to hold it up because probably I'll drop it and that'll be a big mess. So later you can look at it. There's a Cypress Knee. How many know about Cypress Knees? Okay, what do you think Cypress Knees are used or, are for? It's to stabilize the tree, especially because they're in wet, real wet areas. So they would be to stabilize the tree. And this one's pretty old and we've had it at the museum for a pretty long time actually. This is a lovely site to visit. We do a tour called Life of Ham. It's not my story, uh, but I did make the tour up. So anyway, we take people all around the county. One of the first stops that we make is here at Windsor Castle Park and the outbuildings are open and available to tour. Beyond what would become Smithfield, Isle of Wight County also embraced the waterways that flanked it to the north and northeast. So we have Jones Creek, Chuckatuck Creek, Ragged Island Creek, and they provided opportunities for wharfs all along the way that could accommodate ships of shallow to medium draft. The goods of an emerging rural economy were hauled to these waterfront docks and they're consigned to shippers who would take them to market. This is Captain Samuel Wentworth's property that's right there on Main Street. Um, that was his warehouse. His house is a brick house right next to it, 1752. So this is uh, just, just as you turn off at Christ Episcopal Church, this is about two houses down. And so the older part here on the left was built in the mid-1700s, and this other part was the later 1700s. Um, this was his warehouse. But when he passed away, speaking of what Cyprus was used for as far as the furniture, and, but shingles were a vital part of that because the English really wanted those shingles. So in his estate, it was listed that he had 40 to 50,000 Cyprus shingles available. So obviously that was a big deal. And here we have, how did people get across the river? What was the deal? We needed to do something to be able to cross these creeks. As early as 1784, two privately owned ferries were available. There's no record of when they ceased to function, but there were two family owned bridges. The Pierce family owned the bridge across the Pagan Creek and the Purdy family owned the bridge across the Cypress. The county paid the owners a certain sum for each individual who was a county resident to use the bridges but for non-residents, they had to pay a toll. This is a really good record of what was going on with Cypress Creek. This is sort of a history of how important Cypress Creek. Those of you who live in the Cypress Creek neighborhood now, this is your history right here. January 1781, 200 British redcoats of the 80th Regiment of Foot crossed Cypress Creek Bridge to engage the local militia units, and that's Battery Park. They return along the east side to threaten Patriot forces at Mackey's Mill. January 1781, British and Hessian troops route local militia under Josiah Parker and Mackey's Mill by using a footbridge over Cypress Creek. 1828, we just discussed about Scott's factory and the grist mill that took place and we also had manufacturer peanut processing that was later. 1862, Following the Confederate withdrawal, the Cypress Creek Bridge was dismantled to prevent uses by the Union forces, thus creating a military cul-de-sac of the town of Smithfield, which made it much safer to be here than elsewhere. January 1864, 
This was the famous Battle of Smithfield, and that's another tour you can take with Albert that's very interesting. Uh, this Cypress Creek Bridge remnants create an obst obstacle forcing Union troops to go get off at Hodges Wharf, and that's Smithfield Station, beginning the two-day running fight with local Confederates known locally as the Battle of Smithfield. Well, we sort of won that battle. Uh, the Union soldiers, their, their boat got messed up and it blew up and it was kind of a big deal. You'll see an example upstairs. Uh, and uh, also you'll see the eagle, the golden eagle that Captain Nosworthy rushed down and instead of getting coffee and tea and stuff, he rushed down and got a golden eagle. So the bridge over Cypress Creek, then known as Red Point, and of course now we have Red Point Tap House, don't we? Right there. Uh, nearly collapses under the weight of the modern 1917 motor pump fire engine responding from Suffolk to fight the great fire. We did not have a fire department until 1939. An example of the bridge's condition is reflected by the tale of an event in 1846. The bridge over the western branch of the Pagan had fallen into such disrepair that it broke under the weight of a wagon with a driver and two mules. They all perished. In 1880, a similar scene took place at the Cypress Creek Bridge when a driver and two mules plunged through the rails and drowned. I always like to use my big word confluence to describe the location of the bridge located at Smithfield Station. It separates the Pagan Creek and the Cypress and affords a beautiful view of Windsor Castle Park. In 2024, the bridge will be updated it follows work done in 1930, 1950, 1970, and we're really gonna have a great time when they block off the bridge. Over here, you'll see a sign. This is the Cypress Creek Bridge built in 1927, the Virginia Department of Highways, and there's one from 1974, and you recognize Smithfield Station there for sure. You can't see this very well, but those of us who've lived here for a long time know what it's like quite often when we used to go to, by Smithfield Station and the water was way up. That roadbed has been raised about three different times, so it'll be interesting to see what occurs. Now we're going to talk about those of you from Cypress Creek who live there. We're going to talk a little bit about the fact that it was a farm. It became, was bought in 1908, the Cypress Creek subdivision area by Mr. and Mrs. Barlow, G.A. Barlow. So this is one of his, this is interesting because when I just looked, this was probably the payment on the property. It's payment to the bank for $125. It talks about the note. So that was G.A. Barlow. He bought it. Let me just give you a, what he wrote. And this is Gus Barlow. He was a son of Mr. and Ms. Barlow. But the G.A. Barlow and Sons, he was so proud of having this farm and having three sons to work in the farm. One son did the pigs, one son did the dairy, the other son did the row crops. So that was that whole situation there. So this is a, uh, written by Gus Barlow, who was a young man who grew up there. Mom and Daddy were married in 1908. They bought the 200-acre Shady Lawn Farm. The house consisted of three rooms, a stair hall, a cookhouse back in the back, with three bedrooms and a bath upstairs. Daddy always called the kitchen the cook room. In 1925, they built a 20-station dairy farm. No electricity. Think about that now. So this is 20 station dairy farm with no electricity. We got your hands. Uh, cows were milked twice a day, seven days a week. This is my favorite part. We even named some of the cows after my old girlfriend. <laughs> All right. All right. The entire reason we are doing this talk today is because I wanted to show you an asparagus bundler. How many people have ever heard of an asparagus bundler? or buncher. And that this is an antique, one of the local farmers had it, he loaned it to me. I demand that you come and look at it after we're done because it's a once in a lifetime experience. And so as I'm reading this, it says, they raised a field of asparagus, cutting it early in the morning, wrapping it in bundles and putting it on a boat in Smithfield to be shipped to Baltimore, Maryland. Mama always raised chickens, sold eggs, and made her own clothes. Daddy had a vegetable garden and raised hogs. 
for fresh meat and to smoke in the smokehouse. I wonder now how my father was able to work as hard as he did and still managed to go to church every Sunday. Mama never threw anything away, not even butcher paper and string. She used to say, as soon as you throw it away, you'll need it. Through good times and hard times, their devotion to each other saw them through and they never lost their sense of humor. I just thought that was a sweet way to talk about Cypress Creek and what it has become today and the, the family that was there and what they represented. This is an aerial view of what it looked like prior to it becoming what it is today, Cypress Creek. And then we have, this is G.A. Barlow Sr. and this is one of his prized steers. They were dairy uh, steers. They were breeding for dairy. And here, here it is again. He died early. So they did have two children. Kathy Lee is here. Those of you may know her, Kathy Lee Barlow. And then this is the beginning of the golf course. And look at this, not gorgeous, just the way it looks now. And you got the bypass. And look, here you are today. And here is the end of the program. This is one of the adventures from Cypress Creek. You might want to watch out because this could happen to you. This was Mr. A.P. Jones of Six Oaks, which is right up where we were just talking about, caught the largest mink ever known to be caught up in Cypress Creek, measuring 32 inches. That is one big mink. One little tidbit. When I grew up, the Cypress Creek span was a concrete bridge with a draw span operated by large electric motors. The late Perry Griffiths, who with his brother owned Griffiths Tire and Appliance, there was a Griffiths, it was a service station right here, right beside where it is, to, the, um, well, the parking lot of Smithfield Station is. So they would have to find him, and the boaters would have to get off their boats, find him, and have the draw opened up, the gate opened up. So things could be worse, is what I gotta say. Thank you so much for attending today's lecture. Please enjoy your visit to the museum and be sure to check out the museum's website and social media and YouTube channel.